I invite you to open your Bible. There's one in the pew in front of you, perhaps one you brought with you. Maybe it's even one on that tablet or your phone. Just open it up to chapter 5 of Matthew. It is there where we continue past the Beatitudes and now into the continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. So open your Bible, but also open your hearts for God's holy word. I begin with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now that'll rock your world. That'll turn you upside down. It did the Pharisees and scribes. Do you hear what Jesus was saying to them? Unless you can be even more, more able to fulfill all of the laws of the prophets than he, you're not even, you, more than the scribes and the Pharisees, you won't even be able, and they thought for sure they had, a, they had an entry, they had the ticket to heaven for doing what they could do better than no one else could do, obey all of the laws of the prophets and do it superior fashion. But Jesus calls them on it. He helps us to step up, step up to the, the height of the faith, come up to a new place. He wants to completely fulfill the laws, all of them because he's going to get to the heart of the matter, but that's what Jesus always will do with us. Get right to the very core, right to the heart, right to the center of it, and he'll call us on it, and he'll challenge you. He'll challenge every one of us like he did the scribes. When they thought they had it all together and they had all the answers, as when we do, and we think that we've got everything just exactly the way and we know the way, Jesus will call us to the very core, the very heart of the faith. And when he does that, He'll rock our world. He'll rock your life. I feel like he turns you upside down, too, inside out. Because it is that way when we feel like we've got it together and we, have, we know it and we, we're, we're going down the path that, that we're certain of and we're called differently. It rattles us a bit, a lot even. It did for the Pharisees and the scribes. It rocked them to their core so much they couldn't tolerate it anymore. Jesus turning their world upside down. They then, from that moment on, began to find ways to do an end to him, to eliminate him, to stop this radical behavior and this radical teaching that he was shaking people up like this. Well, maybe it doesn't sound like he is here. Maybe it kind of sounds mild, even. Salt and light, ordinary things in this world. Salt and light, we've interpreted and made nice, lovely songs about it and, 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 and wonderful t lessons for, for Sunday school children about salt and light, and they can be interpreted kind of mildly even. But there's nothing mild about the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount indeed turns the world around and upside down. It's a radical teaching of Jesus. You can go into the Scriptures and find it to be so. Jesus will begin with... Deuteronomy in the sixth chapter, in a number of ways he does so, but in one way it is you will teach your children the way to go so that they'll follow after it and they'll, they'll keep on going into the faith. It starts when we're young. We give our children the Holy Scriptures so they will learn from them, so that their lives will be shaped around them, so that they will learn how indeed for their own souls, their own lives, to be disciples 
people of the light, but also so that they will be about changing the world, so that they too will be about a generation which will, which will give the truth, the gospel truth, and radically shift life for themselves, but for the sake of all. You take a look also in Daniel in the sixth chapter, and there you will find about the way his story and his life and the way he was a salt and a light into the world when others gave up because they were pulled away from homelands and into foreign places and foreign kings. But it was there that Daniel remained faithful. He remained faithful to the point where, where the king actually had his whole life shifted, and he began to see the truth that there is a living God, a one and only God, a king who had been worshiping as a pagan as many, many gods and ways. He altered his life because of the example of, da of Daniel, because of his example of the way he lived out in life. The king could look into his life and could see this person lives in a unique way, in a way in which his faith means something to him. And he's strong because of it. Daniel had an inner strength in his body, but all the more so in his, in his spirit. He could stand steadfast even in the face of the powers of this world who were overthrowing a revolution that that king of Babylon was creating. But Daniel had a revolution in the name of God, a revolution that would alter the very soul of humankind that God was coming to teach and to share. In John 4, there's a woman at the well who is nameless. We don't know her name, but she changed her entire village. You remember she was at the well and Jesus met her there? And when Jesus met her there at the well and told her the inner truths about her life, in effect turning her life and world upside down into the ways that she thought she ought to be living, and Jesus called her to a new way to be a person of the light, a disciple of the light. And she received a grace upon grace that transformed her life at the well so that that which she thought she came to have was the water in the well. She got water, living water, Jesus said. It will give you all that you need. And she said, where can I find this? And Jesus let her know that I'm right here for you now, the one who's come and she gave her life as a disciple. And then she called her entire village to do the same. She was a transformed woman. That's the only way you can explain how it was that she was able to give the word of God, Jesus, to that village, and they all accepted him, and they all followed after. Now that's salt of the earth. Now that's a light on the hill shining brightly. That's how she was called, and she did it. We're called to nothing less than that as well, that our lives become radically shifted and changed, and that others can see that there is something in us, in you, that is awesome and wondrous in a way indeed that, that's not like people typically think of the church. I wonder how Jesus would call us into a discipleship, coming into our lives and into our world and into our church even. And how is it that he might call us to have a radical shift for our own selves and in who we are? Seems like we should always be asking that question so that we then can, can have the world look upon us and say, what is going on in that church? What is happening in that body of people in which they are able to enter into the world and, and, and make an enormous difference like they are? I want to be a part of something like that. How often do people in our community say that about we, the church? I want to be a part of a people who who make that kind of a difference. Well, we do make a difference. We do have ways that we are the salt of the earth and the light in the nation, and we do that, and we do it marvelously well. And Jesus would call us to a higher level and a higher standard as well. He would shake us up from places of complacency, wouldn't he? He would rattle us a bit and make us uneasy and uncomfortable in our settings because it is true that too often we gather as the church as a comfortable body just to be and just to relax and just have a moment of peace for ourselves. I like that about church. I like that about coming here on a Sunday where I can just be at peace, find a time to focus, time to find a breathe and just let loose of the burdens. That's what worship is. And that's important and that's a good thing. 
But there is a place and a way in which worship is the way that God comes to us and speaks directly to us to say, I want to give to you a way that will shake your life and that will rise you up to a new place and a new occasion. So we can always be asking it and wondering about it. One of the places that we'll see it fulfilled is in the Acts of the Apostles. So if you look into that, after the Gospels are presented, then what happens in the book of Acts but a revolutionary kind of a book? In the book of Acts, you can read and see, now what did the early church do regarding, regarding the Gospel of Jesus and regarding how Jesus presented these Sermon on the Mount and these points of salt and light? What did they do? It was a radical shift that was given through this Acts of the Apostles in, in, in that book, and it has come to be where the church then, in that early days especially, was anything but just an ordinary place. It was a place that the world looked to and said, they indeed are turning us upside down. Maybe we ought to experience that more often as the people of Jesus gather together, that a riot would break out. That's what N.T. Wright would say about the Acts of the Apostles in that book. This is what he says. Acts could be accurately named another day, another riot, <laughs> because that was the life of the early church. Wherever they seemed to go, a riot would break out. People would get up in arms about what they were saying and what they were doing, these radical Christians, and they would be shaken to the core. There was another song, and it's sung by who? but by Mary. My soul, it magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arms. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has lifted the hungry with good things and sent the rich empty away. He has helped the servant Israel in a remembrance of his mercy and according to the promises he has made to all of our ancestors forever. He is the one who shakes us up, who calls us, to live in that way of mercy, of his love that's given freely, that's offered to all. How do we be a salt in the world today? How are you called to be light in the nations? How we live makes a difference and it impacts the world. How we're called to be salt of the earth and a light to the nations and we need to tell the truth, and we need to stand up for one another, and we need to stand up especially for those who don't seem to have a voice and who are on that lowest rung of the ladder or who are powerless in the midst of power. That's what Mary was saying would happen. It would turn upside down in that way. That's where Jesus is calling us to, a profound life that can give people hope when they've had no hope when they thought they were powerless against a force that would do them harm.